they ever put drinking coffee in the Olympics, <clears throat> I'm going to be the Michael Phelps of that stuff. Mission accomplished on the swigging the coffee down. I love this shirt, and I'm going to go hang out with a friend, Kevin, who will totally appreciate it. Me, Willie, and Ja will be hanging out. Well, we got to go do our vlog today first, of, of course, but then we're going to go watch football with our buddy Kevin. Kevin and I have a really cool story, actually. Uh, my very first year living in California. Uh, a band from where I'm from, Dayton, Ohio. I had met him when I was back on my very first like visit after like the first three months of living here. And uh, they were really popular in Dayton, and their manager wanted to send me some material to pass around out here if I knew anybody. For some reason, they were having trouble mail... Like, they were the post office was having trouble delivering it, so... I, and uh, the manager had said, well, we put the band stickers all over the box. It shouldn't be hard for them to find. So I went down to the post office. I'm at the window asking for it. And I said, well, they, they said that the box has the band's name all over it. There should be a bunch of stickers that say shrug all over it. And about a minute later, while the lady was off looking for uh, my package, a bald guy comes up, taps me on the shoulder and said, are you talking about shrug from Dayton, Ohio? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I know those guys, I'm from that area, and he introduced himself, his name's Kevin, and he goes, I promote bands and get them on the radio for like college airplay, and I go, wow, that's pretty interesting, I was actually thinking of releasing a 7 inch record, so he gave me his number and everything, and uh, he actually was the program director for the uh, radio station I grew up listening to, well, at least grew up listening to in my high school years, um, he was the program director there, which basically means he ran the, ran the place. Um, turned out to be a really awesome dude and has been my friend for 16 years now. You guys will get to meet Kevin. And uh, what Kevin did was I had a band called Candyland Rights, and it just started out me and Michael. Uh, Michael recorded everything, and he let me write everything and play all the instruments and everything. We put together a four-song, seven-inch record, and um, it's when I had a little bit of money. It cost about a 1000 bucks to get a 1000 of them made. Um, and I called Kevin and said, look, I don't have a whole lot of money, but I'd like to get it played on the radio. And he goes, I think doing a seven inch was the best idea you could have done because people get interested when they see something like that. He goes, if you send a CD, they get CDs all day, so they may not play it. Uh, but you know, doing a seven inch record is a good idea. I took it over, let him listen to it. He goes, I love it. I'll do this for you for free. Well, not free. Here's how I'm going to charge you. He goes, someday in our life. I will want to record my own record, and I don't play guitar, I play bass. So he said, I want you to play guitar on it, some point in our life. And I said, okay, that's a deal. So someday in our life, we are going to record Kevin's album, and our friend Jay Madewell, who was in uh, Lexo and the Leapers from my favorite band, Guided by Voices, it was a side project of Guided by Voices, he's going to be the drummer on it. And uh, whenever I go back to Dayton, I always hang out with Jay, hang out with Kevin, a lot of trips back to Ohio, we've all hung out. Like, we've just all happened to be there at the same time. So, that's the story of my friend Kevin. And uh, Kevin and I share a massive appreciation for bluegrass and country music and Willie Nelson. And you're going to meet him today. Boom! And I just thought I'd show you this. This was it. This was the 7-inch record that Kevin and I put out. I'll actually open it up because one of the cool things that happened, and this is kind of been a staple throughout my life as I love to make things collectible so as you can tell down here I hand numbered every single one of them with my own little hands and um, the lady who manufactured the record liked me so much as a person just because I was a young kid and I she loved my enthusiasm that I was doing this on my own she said I'll tell you what instead of just doing black records if we're pressing a colored pressing uh, before yours I'll leave some of the color in so that you can have some color records and she said the deal will have to be that um, I'll do your pressings when in between other jobs. And I said, no problem. She ended up doing three different colors. This one was the marble orange version. All right, time for us to go. Well, here we are at the Nicole Brown Simpson murder site. I, may, I am going to walk over there. They've changed it a little bit. They've changed the entrance. So I'm going to walk across and at least give you guys a little view. They've got it really heavily covered up so you can't really see much. But, but I still wanted to do this one anyway since I was in the neighborhood. Now obviously I'm sure most of you know that the address was changed. 
since the murders because, you know, it attracts a lot of tourists. So I think it was, the address originally was 875, now it's 877. And uh, yeah, they've changed the front quite a bit. I'll try and uh, post a picture of the way the front used to look, but um, they've changed the front quite a bit. Like I said, I'll show you guys where the old entrance was and where the, uh, kind of where the murders would have been committed, the location anyway. And then now they've changed the, the front entrance, just kind of, you know, obviously to throw off the uh, appearance of what everybody saw on television. So I'll be showing you guys that. I'll just do a walking by tour because you really can't see much. Maybe I'll go around back in the alley and get a back alleyway because they say if most of you uh, believe that OJ did it, part of the theory was that he entered through the back alley. Right here. I'm gonna walk right by it. This is the condominium that Nicole Brown Simpson lived in when she was murdered. They've changed the front a little bit. You can tell because the way this street goes, the, the, the number after this should be lower, 877. It should be 875 and now it's not. Now it's 879, but that is the new entrance and right over that gate is where Nicole and Ron Golden would have been murdered. Can't really see much, but that is the same grout. The same. I went ahead and included a few photos from the crime scene, not to be morbid, but just to show you that the tiles are still the same tiles and how the entrance used to look. It's pretty chilling. It's the same exact stuff. I don't know who lives there, but that place is amazing. Wow, I love it. Well, here's the back of the building. An 879, you can tell that this is, you can tell that they would have changed it because this is 877, 879, and the way the street addresses go, that should be 875. So this is what, the, this is where you know, if you think that OJ did it, this is where OJ, the theory was that he, that he parked and he would have went up this walkway right here. He would have went right in that white door over top of that. So that's it. That's about as much as you can get from the Nicole Brown Simpson murder house. And from the street, that's what you'd see. The Nicole Brown Simpson, OJ Simpson murder house. All right, John, I made it over to Kevin's house to watch the game. I'm a Bengals fan, Kevin's a Colts fan, because Kevin actually grew up in Indiana, but he worked a lot in Ohio. That's how we, how we have our uh, connection. Something about Ohio people, like if you've lived there for an extended amount of time, if you spend any time there, there just seems to be like a ken immediate kinship that just strikes up when you meet other people that have lived in your area. Not quite the same with California in my experience. Here's Kevin wearing his famous General's jersey from when he played against the Harlem Globetrotters. Well, we're back in the Franklin Village. Kevin didn't really want to be on camera today because he said, this is my day off, man. I spend all day, all week in media. I don't want to be in media this on my day off. Understandable, he's just goofing off. The jersey he was wearing when he lived in Indiana, they needed a fill-in player for the Generals when the uh, Harlem Globetrotters came to town and so he played and he always wears that jersey like kind of on Sundays. So we're, uh, we're back in the neighborhood just gonna chill out for the rest of the night and uh, I see a puppy up here so I'm sure, sure Jaws gonna say hi. What's going on here? I just I just watched you get under the covers Yoda. I just watched you get under the covers and then wrestle around in there and then pop your head out. What's going on over here? Yep, that's pretty much what they say. No money, no honey. I do realize, and I am sorry, that 
early on in this vlog, there's about two or three minutes of just me talking over the image of a t-shirt. I realized it when I kind of got it going and that's what it was gonna be and I wish I wouldn't have. But I also was halfway through the story when I realized it and just didn't want to shut it down, so. Sorry you had to stare at a Willie, Mose and emo Willie Nelson emoticon for about three minutes while nothing else was happening, but that's not always the way it goes. But it went that way tonight. Vlog over.